Freddy the Pig, to and again. Chapter 4 And so the animals started out into the wide world. Although it was late in the fall and the branches were bare, the sun was bright and the air was fresh and warm. For some time they walked along together in silence, for they were a little sad at the thought of the comfortable home and the good friends they had left behind. But the smiling valley through which the road ran was too pleasant to be sad in for very long, and then pretty soon Freddy, who was very clever, began to sing a song he had just made up, and this is the song he sang. Oh, the sailor may sing of his tall, swift ships, of sailing the deep blue sea, but the long white road where the adventures wait is the better life for me. On the open road, when the sun goes down, your home is wherever you are. The sky is your roof, and the earth is your bed, and you hang your hat on a star. You wash your face in the clear, cold dew, and you say good night to the moon, and the wind in the treetops sing you to sleep with a drowsy, bowsy tune. Then it's hay for the joy of a roving life from Florida up to Nome. For since I've no home in any one spot, wherever I am is home. There were a good many other verses, too many to put down, for Freddy made up as he went along, and there was a chorus to each verse that went like this. Oh, the winding road is long, is long, but never too long for me, and we'll cheer each mile with a song, a song, a song as we ramble along, along so fearless and happy and free. And pretty soon, as their spirits rose, they thought of the adventures that lay ahead of them and the merry life they would lead. They all began to sing. They roared out the chorus with a will, and even the mice sang in their little squeaky voices. The mice had got tired walking by this time because their legs were too short. So Mrs. Wiggins had invited them up on her back which was so broad that there was no danger of them falling off, and they could sit there and enjoy the scenery and watch everything go by, just as they do from the window of a train. All the morning they went steadily on. Every now and then they would have to go to one side of the road to let an automobile or a farm wagon pass them, and every time that happened the people would stare and stare. Why, just look at those animals, they would exclaim. Did you ever see anything like that in your life? And after they had gone by, the people would stop their automobile or their horses and stare after them until they were out of sight. About noon, they would climb a steep hill, and from the top they could see ahead of them a broad valley, very much like the one through which they had come and beyond the valley were more hills. This is all strange country to me now, said Hank, the old white horse. I've driven as far as this with Mr. Bean, but I've never been down into that valley. We'd better have a look at the map. There is a stream crossing the road halfway down the hill, said Robert the dog. Let's go down there. So they went down and camped beside the stream, and the larger animals went in wading and splashed each other and laughed and shouted, and the two white ducks, Alice and Emma, swam about, looking like two white powder puffs, because that is what they like to do best. But Jinx the cat stayed on the bank and studied the map that the robin had drawn for him to see if they were going in the right direction. Then, when the animals were tired of splashing about in the stream, they came up on the bank and rested, and Jink showed them the map. We have to go across the valley, and those hills, and then across another valley, and more hills, and then we come to a river, he said. And we follow the river until we come to the village, and there we shall find a bridge. But will the people in the village let us cross the bridge? asked Eek. It was funny to see him and the three other mice sitting peaceably beside the cat. But Jinx had promised not to chase them, and they were not afraid. Cats very seldom make promises, but when they do, they always keep them. Their word is as good as their bond. 
I have heard Mrs. Bean say that Mr. Bean, Jinx answered, never to cross a bridge until you come to it. So we'd better not worry about this one. And now, don't you think we'd better get going? So they got up and started down the hill. Halfway down, they had their first adventure. They heard an automobile behind them and turned out and turned out to let it go by. It came along rattling and bumping, for it was not a very good automobile, and as it passed them a man with a big black mustache leaned out and stared in surprise. Hey, Sonny, he said to the boy who was driving, wait a minute. Look at them animals. By gum, I never see anything like that before. The boy who had a very dirty face, stopped the automobile, and they both stared back at the animals. "'There's nobody with them," said the boy. "'Who do you suppose they belong to?' "'Dunno,' said the man, and he began to get out. "'But we'll just drive them down to my place, I guess. "'If they do belong to somebody, we'll get a reward for them, "'and if they don't, we'll keep them ourselves. "'The cow looks like a good milker, can't say much for the horse, though, homely brute. Hank gave a loud snort at this, for while he was not a vain horse, he had a proper pride in the neat appearance he had, and he thought the man's remark insulting, which indeed it was. That's a nice pig, said the boy. We haven't had roast pig in a long time, Pa. Nor roast duck, said the man, as he licked his black mustache and looked greedily at Alice and Emma. I'll get a rope and tie the cow, and you take some stones and drive the dog away. He reached into the car for his rope. This was too much for the animals, who had been undecided what to do. I don't care for these people at all, said Mrs. Wiggins emphatically. Robert, you and Jinx chase that dirty-faced boy away before he can pick up some stones. Don't hurt him. Just give him a good scare. I'll attend to the man. And lowering her horns, she galloped straight at him. Now the cows are almost always good-natured and peaceful animals, and the man was very much surprised. He tried to dodge behind the car, but she scooped him up in her horns and tossed him high in the air. And as he went up, Mrs. Wiggins put her forehead to the back of the automobile and pushed it ahead so that it would be under him when he came down, which he presently did with a thump on the automobile top. He bounced once or twice, like a rubber ball, then, frightened but unhurt, peered over the edge of the top at Mrs. Wiggins, who was walking around the car and shaking her horns and mooing in a terribly frightening way. She was really laughing, but the man didn't know that. Meanwhile, the dog and the cat had chased the boy away across the field, and he was even more badly frightened than the man, for after they stopped chasing him, he kept on running, and after he was out of sight, they could still hear his terrified yells. There, I guess we settled them, said Mrs. Wiggins, as she sat down in the road and bellowed with laughter until the tears ran down her cheeks and the man with the black mustache shivered with fear. Mrs. Wiggins was very fond of a joke. Pretty soon the animals started on again, and then they had gone half a mile or so. They looked back and saw the man climb slowly down and get into the automobile, but he did not come after them. He turned round and went back up the hill and went home another way. Mrs. Wiggins was a character. That means that when she did anything, she always did it in a little different way than anyone else would have done. And she did a good many things that nobody else would have ever thought of. There were two spiders, Mr. and Mrs. Webb, that lived up in the roof of the cow barn. Of course, they had heard everything that had gone on the night the animals had their meeting. And the next morning, Mrs. Webb slid down a long thread and landed on Mrs. Wiggin's nose. And after Mrs. Wiggins shook her head and asked the spider to get off, she tickled. But Mrs. Webb crept up close to the cow's ear and said, I want your advice about something. 
This flattered Mrs. Wiggins, because very few people ever asked a cow's advice about anything. So, she said she would listen. Now spiders have very little voices, and even animals who hear better than people have to be very close to them to understand what they say. So Mrs. Webb crept still closer to Mrs. Wiggins' ear and said, Mrs. Wiggins, me and Mr. Webb have been talking it over, and we'd like to go on this trip with all you animals. It's cold here in the winter, and there are very few flies, and we have to sleep most of the time. Do you suppose it could be managed? Mrs. Wiggins thought and thought, and finally she said, I'd be glad to do you and Mr. Webb a good turn, because you keep the cow barn clear of flies in the summer, and as far as your coming along goes. That isn't bothering me, for you can ride on my back. But I've been wondering how you could catch another fly to keep you alive. That's just the difficulty, said the spider. We'd be traveling all day, and even if we spun a web at night, when we camped, the flies wouldn't get caught in it till the next morning, and then we'd be gone. Mrs. Wiggins thought some more, and then she said, I've got it. Suppose you spin a web between my horns. Then you'll have it with you all day, and you can catch plenty of flies. And Mrs. Webb was so delighted that she danced about on all her eight legs and tickled Mrs. Wiggins' ears terribly. And then she ran up her thread as fast as she could go and told her husband. And so they went along on the trip to Florida. This was just the kind of thing Mrs. Wiggins was always doing. The animals went on down the hill and across the second valley. They met a few people in automobiles or on foot, but the people only stared and did not try to stop them. Then about four o'clock, Alice and Emma, who had got tired and were riding on Hank's back, began quacking excitedly. There's something funny coming down the road after us. It's a, in a cloud of dust, they said. Automobile, probably, said Hank. It's too small for an automobile, said Alice. Then it's a man, said Mrs. Wiggins. That's too small for a man. And it came too fast, said Emma. Then they all stopped and looked, and away back on the road they saw a tiny cloud of dust coming along at great rate, and they could not imagine what it could be. And then the wind blew the dust aside for a moment, and they all sat up, and made a cheer, for they saw that it was Charles the rooster and Henrietta his wife. And if you don't believe that a hen can run fast, you should have seen them coming down that road. In a very few minutes, they had caught up with their friends, and then there was a great shouting and laughing and asking of questions, but they were both so out of breath that they could not speak for quite ten minutes. Henrietta spoke first. Good gracious! What a day I've had, she exclaimed, fanning herself with her wing. Yes, we decided to come. Charles felt so bad this morning when you all started out, so I got my sisters to take his place in the mornings. There are eight of them, you see. That makes one for each day in the week and one over to look after the children or help out if one of the others is sick. "'But can your sisters crow?' asked Freddy. "'Crow?' said Henrietta. "'Of course you, they can crow. "'Any hen can crow if she wants to, "'better than any rooster that ever was hatched.' "'Why don't you ever do it then?' asked Jinx. "'Good gracious, what a silly question, Cat. "'The roosters would never get up at all in the morning "'if the hens started to crow.' They'd loaf around and sleep all day. They do little enough as it is, but at least they're out of the hen house early in the morning so their wives can get some work done. Hmm, crow indeed, I guess not. The animals were all glad to have Charles and Henrietta with them, and they went on for a way and camped that night under a big oak tree by the side of the road. 
For a time they sat about and told stories and jokes and made plans for the future, but they were all tired, and one by one they dropped off to sleep before Charles's eyes closed. He looked drowsily up at the starry sky above him and at the long, mysterious white road by which they had camped. "'What a wonderful time we're going to have,' he muttered sleepily. "'This is the first time since I was a chick that I haven't had to worry about getting up in the morning.' Oh, the winding road is long, is long, but never too long for me, and will cheer each mile, mileth song, song. His voice trailed off into silence, and he was sound asleep. Chapter 5 At the first glimmer of daylight next morning, Charles awoke. He stretched his wings, flapped them a couple of times, and then before he knew what was going on, gave a loud crow. He had perched on a limb of the oak tree, and just under him Hank was standing fast asleep. Horses can sleep standing up as well as lying down, because they have four legs and don't fall over, and Hank had gone to sleep that way because the grass was wet with dew, and he thought if he lay down on it, it would be bad for his rheumatism. When Charles crowed, Hank opened his eyes. Goodness, he said, you startled me. I thought you were not going to crow this morning. You said you were going to sleep till ten o'clock. Charles looked foolish. I suppose, he said, that I've got so in the habit of getting up early and crowing that I do it without thinking. Well, in that case, said Hank, I don't see why you complain so much about it. If you do it without thinking about it, it's just like breathing and nobody ever complains about having to breathe. No, said Charles, that's gospel truth. I expect, said Hank, that you've complained about it for so long that you do that without thinking too. This was a little hard for Charles to understand, but he thought about it for a while, and then he said, You're right, Hank. I never realized it before. I don't really mind getting up and crowing a bit. Now I come really to think of it, but, he added in a whisper, don't tell Henrietta I said so. By the time the sun was up and the animals were all up too and getting their breakfast, Hank and Mrs. Wiggins ate the long, juicy grass and, that grew beside the road, and Freddy ate the acorns that had fallen from the oak tree, and Charles and Henrietta and the mice ate beech nuts from a beech nut tree nearby. And Charles and Henrietta ate the nuts whole by the mice held them in their forepaws and stripped off the husks with their sharp little teeth and ate the sweet kernels. And Mrs. Wiggins gave the dog and cat some milk and the spiders sat up between Mrs. Wiggins' horns where they had spun their web and caught flies for breakfast. They all breakfasted well, but Alice and Emma Ducks like to eat the juicy weeds and things that they find in the mud at the bottom of the pond. But of course there wasn't any pond handy. So Alice and Emma ate a few beech nuts that the mice shelled for them and said they would wait for the rest of their breakfast until they came to a river. It was not until early in the afternoon that they came down a long hill into another valley and found the wide, swift river that the robin had marked on the map. Here they sat down and rested while the ducks dived for their meal in the shallow water under the bank. Mrs. Wiggins was very much interested in the diving. I do wish I could do that, she said. Just think how exciting it must be to be down among the fishes and see all the odd things that grow on the bottom and look up at the sky through the green water. She had been leaning over the edge as she talked and all of a sudden the bank gave way, and down she went into the water with a terrible splash. And there she was, sitting in the river with the water up to her neck. The animals all rushed to help her and pull her out, but they could do nothing for her, for she was quite helpless with laughter. She laughed and she laughed. Here I am, she said, down among the fishes where I wanted to be. Nothing like having your wishes come true. But suddenly she stopped laughing. 
goodness me she exclaimed where are mr and mrs webb they were sitting on my head when i fell in she clambered hurriedly up the bank and then they all searched the bushes along the shore for a long distance downstream but the spiders were nowhere to be found well said mrs wiggins at last i guess they're gone they won't drown that's a comfort they'll float down and land somewhere but the current is pretty swift and they may go miles before they can get ashore i don't suppose we'll ever see them again i hope this will be a lesson to me cutting up silly didos on the bank like a two-week-old calf she was very angry with herself the animals all agreed however that it wasn't her fault and pretty soon they started on again they followed the river for some time and by and by the white houses of the village and the high arches of the bridge ahead of them i vote we wait till after dark to go through the village said robert those people are sure to chase us or try to lock us up or something if they see us this seemed a sensible plan so they sat down by the river to wait pretty soon they heard a rattling and a puffing coming along the road and then an automobile came into sight and in it were the men with the black mustache and the boy with the dirty face and behind it ran a black dog twice as big as robert and three times as fierce looking as soon as the man saw the animals he stopped the machine now we've got em sonny he said here jack he called to the dog sick em jack go after em chew em up the dog growled and bounded across the road but mrs wiggins lowered her horns and shook them threateningly and robert barked the cat arched its back and spat even freddy squealed angrily and the dog stopped you'd better not bother us said mrs wiggins i don't want to said the dog i haven't got anything against you but he'll beat me if i don't why do you stay with him if he beats you asked robert where could i go if i didn't stay with him asked the dog come along with us said robert and he told him where they were going that's fine said the dog as he walked towards them wagging his tail hey jack called the angry man what's the matter with you you useless good-for-nothing cur i'll beat you within an inch of your life and he picked up a stick and started after the dog but now that jack had found some new friends he wasn't afraid of his cruel master any more he turned with a growl and before the man could lift the stick he was flat on his back on the road with jack's forepaws on his chest then the man changed his tune good jack good old boy he said let me up that's a good dog but jack didn't move and the other animals came and sat in a ring around the man and the boy jumped out of the automobile and ran across the field yelling just as he had done before i don't know that i blame him after a while they all thought that had scared the man enough they let him go and he walked over to the automobile without a word and got in and drove off then jack told them that he had lived with the man for five years and that it had indeed been a terrible life for the man hardly gave him anything to eat and he beat him nearly every day i guess mr bean is a pretty good master after all said hank and at least he never beats us if some things aren't just as we should like to have them it's because he's poor and can't afford to have them better you don't happen to have a bone about you do you asked robert i haven't had a good gnaw since i left home the farm where i have been living is just a little ways back along the road said jack and i buried two good bones in the orchard yesterday if you'll come with me we'll get them can you spare the time there's plenty of time said robert because we can't start out until after dark so the two dogs raced off together to get the bones all this time mr and mrs webb had been floating peacefully downstream on a swift current of the river spiders can float because they are very light but they can't move round much on the water because it is so slippery under their feet 
For every step they take is one in one direction, they slide two in another. Mr. and Mrs. Webb just sat still and sailed along and admired the changing scenery of the banks. I don't know why anyone should want a private yacht when they can travel like this, said Mr. Webb. It's delightful, though I must say I'm sorry to miss the trip to Florida. No use crying over spilt milk, said his wife, or spilt spiders either, and that's what we are. We'll never see those animals again, even if we could get over the bank and climb up to the road before they came along. They'd go right by without either seeing or hearing us. But, said Mr. Webb, they spoke of crossing a bridge further down the river. If we got to that before they did, we could try to make them see us anyway. Now that's an idea, exclaimed his wife. You've got a head on you, Webb. I always knew you did have, in spite of what my father said about you before we were married. I know what he said well enough without you repeating it every five minutes, grumbled Mr. Webb. He said I didn't have gumption enough to catch a lame fly without wings. That's what you're thinking about, I suppose. No, said Mrs. Webb. I was thinking about the time he said you'd never be hanged for your beauty, and you ought to. That's enough, said Mr. Webb crossly. You'd be better occupied thinking about what we're going to do when we get to the bridge than raking up all those old things. There it is, just ahead of us. So Mrs. Webb stopped talking, and they began to think up a plan, and by the time they were almost at the bridge, they had decided what they would do. The current bore them swiftly down towards one of the arches, but under the arch some dead branches were sticking up through the water, and they caught hold of these and climbed up over to the bridge. They haven't come by yet, said Mr. Webb, as they had examined all the footprints of animals that were plainly marked in the dust on the floor of the bridge. There have been some horses and dogs along here to do today, but no cows or pigs or cats or ducks. So they both climbed up to the iron beam on one side of the bridge, and each of them fastened the end of the thread to the beam, and then they dropped down, spinning out the thread as they went and carried it across the bridge and fastened the other end of the iron beam on the other side. They did this several times until they had a bridge of thread strong enough to hold them both right across the roadway and about 10 feet above it. Then they walked out to the middle of it and waited. Of course, they did not know that the animals had decided to wait until after dark to cross the bridge. And by the time the sun had gone down and the stars had begun to wink out, the lights to twinkle in the houses, they commenced to be worried. But there was nothing to be done but wait. And at last they heard the shuffle and the patter of many paws and hoofs, and the animals came down the road and on the bridge. They were walking as quietly as possible so that the people in the houses would not hear them, but spiders can see in the dark. And when Mrs. Wiggins' nose was just under them, they each slid spinning down a thread and landed on it. Mrs. Wiggins gave a tremendous sneeze that nearly blew them off, for they had tickled her nose dreadfully, but they hung on tight. Dear me, said Mrs. Wiggins, I do hope I'm not catching a cold, being out so late at night. But Mr. Webb had crawled up close to her ear, and he said, It's us, Mrs. Wiggins, the Webbs. We waited for you on the bridge. Then Mrs. Wiggins told the other animals what had happened, and they were so glad that they gave a loud cheer, and they all said how happy they were to have the webs with them again, and how clever the spiders were to have thought of such a good scheme. And all the villagers came to their doors and looked out to see what the noise was. But by the time the travelers were across the bridge and didn't care, that night they came they camped in a deserted barn 
and it was lucky they did, for towards morning a heavy shower came up. But the roof was still good, and though most of them woke up when the rain started, they were dry and warm, and soon they went back to sleep again, with the pleasantest sound in the world in their ears, the soft drumming of rain on the shingles. Chapter 6 So for two weeks the animals traveled on towards Florida. It must be a long way, said Hank. The weather doesn't seem to get any warmer. But it doesn't get any colder either, said Mrs. Wiggins, and down here the leaves are still on the trees. When we left home, the trees round the farm had all shed their leaves and were ready for the winter. Well, I don't care how far it is, said Hank. We're certainly having a good time. I shall be almost sorry when we get there. Nearly every day, now large flocks of birds pass by them overhead, southward bound, and one morning the same swallow who had first put the idea of migrating into Charles's head dropped down from the sky and circled about them. She had left home two days earlier, and she gave them all the news of the farm, the messages from their relatives, and told them that Mr. and Mrs. Bean were well, but they felt very bad that the animals had left them. At first, she said, Mr. Bean thought someone had stolen you, but then somehow he guessed that you had decided to go to Florida for the winter. I heard him tell Mrs. Bean that he hoped you'd have a good time and come back safe and sound in the spring, and he said that he was going to try to make things more comfortable for you, although he didn't know how he'd manage it because he didn't have any money to fix things up the way they ought to be. When the animals heard this, they felt a little sorry that they had left Mr. Bean without saying goodbye. But we'll bring him something nice from Florida when we get back, they said. As far as they had kept away from the cities as much as possible because they were afraid that the people would not understand that they were migrating and would try to lock them up and keep them. And when they had to go through villages, they always waited until late at night when everybody was asleep. But at last one day, away off in the distance, they saw a little speck of gold that glittered and sparkled in the bright sunlight. They wondered and wondered what the gold thing could be, but none of them knew, and pretty soon as they went along, the road turned into a street, and there were houses on both sides of it, and the trolley tracks down the middle, and the speck of gold grew bigger and bigger, and it looked as if the great golden balloon was tethered along the trees ahead of them. "'We're coming to a city,' said Robert. "'We'd better turn off this road and go round it.' "'I wish I knew what the gold thing is,' said Freddy the pig. Freddy had a very inquiring mind. Just then a little woolly white dog with a very fancy blue ribbon round his neck came along, and Freddy asked him. The little dog struck, stuck his nose up in the air. "'Don't speak to me, you common pig,' he said. "'Eh?' said Freddy. "'What's the matter with you? I only asked you a civil question.' "'Go away, you vulgar creature,' said the little dog snippily. "'Ho, ho,' said Freddy. "'You're too stuck up to talk to a pig, are you?' And he laughed and ran at the little dog and rolled him over and over in the road till his white coat and blue ribbon were both gray with dust. Then he stood him on his feet and said, Now answer my question. Then the little dog meekly told him that the thing that looked like a golden balloon was the dome of the Capitol, and that the city they were coming to was Washington, where the president lives. And when Freddy had gone, had given him a lecture on politeness, and it helped him to brush the dust off himself. He let him go. I'd like to see the president, said Hank. All the others said they would too, but they were afraid to go into the city because the people might lock them up, and the boys were sure to throw stones at them. But Jinx the cat said, I vote we go. Just the same. I don't believe the president will let them do anything to us. And we can see the Capitol and the Washington Monument, and maybe go up to the White House and call on the President. So they decided to go, and started down the street toward the city. All the people came out on the doorsteps to watch them go by, but nobody bothered them, 
and by and by they came to the capital. They stood for a long time and admired the big white building with its many columns and its gilded dome, and then they walked round to the side and admired it from some more. And while they were standing there, two senators in silk hats came out to see them. I don't know animals ever visited the capital, said the first senator. Neither did I, said the second senator. But I don't see why they shouldn't. I think it's rather nice. Then a third senator came out and joined the other two. And he said, By George, I have heard about these animals. They belong to one of my constituents. They are going to Florida for the winter, and I believe they are the first animals that ever migrated. This gentleman is one of the most important occurrences in the animals of this august assemblage. I am going to order a band, and take them round and show them the city. So he went in and ordered the band and told the other senators, who put their heads out of the windows and smiled and waved at the animals. "'What's a constituent?' asked Mrs. Wiggins, but none of the others told her, and to this day she has never found out. Pretty soon the band came and struck up marching through Georgia and went up to the wide avenue towards the White House, and the animals marched behind. First came the senator in his high hat, and then Charles and Henrietta, and then Mrs. Wiggins, and the mice sitting on the back, and then the two dogs and Freddy the pig, and then Hank and Alice and Emma on his back, and last came Jinx. They all walked to in time to the music and held their heads up and pretended not to see any of the people that crowded the sidewalks, as everyone always does when he is in a parade. Beside them walked twenty policemen to keep the people back and to prevent them from pulling the tail feathers out of the ducks or chickens to keep as souvenirs. They went all over the city. The senator showed them all the fine buildings and parks and monuments, and last they came to the White House, and there was the president out on the front porch, smiling and bowing to them, and as they filed past, he shook them each by a claw or a paw or a hoof, and even Eek and Quick and Eeny and the cousin Augustus overcame their timidity to put their tiny paws into the president's big hand. They were all very proud, and they went on with the band playing a different tune every ten minutes, and the people cheering and waving handkerchiefs. Then they got to the edge of the city, and the band stopped, and the senator made them a speech which began, Friends and constituents, I am very sensible of the honor which you have done me today. To welcome a delegation of the home folks to the nation's capital is one of the few pleasures that cheers the burdened brow of those whose stern duty it is to keep their shoulder always to the wheel of the ship of state. And that reminds me of the story of the two Irishmen. He told the story, and the animals laughed politely, although they did not see anything very funny about it. And that is why it is not written down here, nor is the rest of the senator's speech written down, for the animals did not understand much of it, and I am not at all sure that the senator did either, but all agreed that it was a stirring speech. Then the senator said goodbye to the adventurers, and the band played Old Lang Syne, and the animals went on their way. Well, said Mrs. Wiggins with a sigh, as she dropped off to sleep that night, we certainly had a grand time. But I do wish I knew what a constituent is.